there was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> That's the opening ch sentence of C.S. Lewis's story, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and one of the best opening lines ever. Such opening lines make you want to read on. The rest of the book has got to be good. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is the third book in a series of seven that came to be known as the Chronicles of Narnia. The opening lines of the previous two books were less memorable. If you've read all of the books, do you remember the first line of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. Not exactly an attention grabber, is it? Well, what about the second book? Do you remember the first sentence of Prince Caspian? There, once there were four children <laughs> whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. Not exactly original, was it? I'm going to suggest tonight that the first sentence of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader signals that in this book, Lewis was making a new beginning. His, he sets off in some new directions, experiments with some new possibilities and approaches. And that seems a bit surprising, because when he started the book, he thought it would be his last book on Narnia. At least that's what he said in a letter to 11-year-old Lawrence Krieg in 1957, after the series was done. When I wrote The Lion, I did not know I was going to write anymore. Then I wrote P Prince Caspian as a sequel and still didn't think there would be any more. And when I had done The Voyager, I, the, uh, Voyage, I thought quite sure it would be the last. The new directions he experimented with in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader may have had the welcome but unintended effect of making Lewis want to pursue those characteristics further and to write more books about Narnia. Before looking at these new directions, however, I must lay out one assumption. Talking about new directions in the Chronicles of Narnia makes sense only when the books are considered in order of publication or in the order in which they were written. That means starting with the book originally designated as number one, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but now labeled number two. I think the renumbering of the Chronicles, making the magician's nephew book one, was a big mistake. The only reason for putting the magician's nephew first is to have, a readers, to have readers encounter events in chronological order, the order in which things happen. And that, as every storyteller knows, is quite unimportant as a reason. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was conceived in Lewis's imagination as an introduction to Narnia. It uses strategies appropriate for a first book. Those strategies lose their full effects if the book is not read first. The best example of that difference is in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when Mr. Beaver first mentions the name Aslan and the narrator says, none of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. That carefully crafted sentence has a very different effect if you've read the, or if the reader has already read The Magician's Nephew. The first of Lewis's new directions is the use of humor. Lewis had a wonderful sense of humor. Richard Ladborough, a close friend when he and Lewis were colleagues at Cambridge, Cambridge University, remembered him as jovial, a man who delighted not only in hearing funny stories, but also in telling them. And in this, he was an expert. Lewis's stepson, Douglas Gresham, remarks on his enormous humor and the vibrancy of his wit. You couldn't be with Jack for more than five or 10 minutes without roaring with laughter, he says. Humor is readily apparent in two of, earliest, uh, of Lewis's earlier books, The Screwed Letters and The Great Divorce. But there isn't much humor in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or Prince Caspian. 
All of that changes with the opening sentence of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Lewis seems to be trying something different in this book, right from the start. And the humor continues throughout the book. It shows up in Eustace's confrontations with a sword-wielding mouse, and it shows up in Eustace's diary entries. Like is calling the Dawn Treader a rotten little thing. No proper saloon, no radio, no bathrooms, no deck chairs. I try to tell Caspian what real ships are like, but he's too dense. <laughs> Best of all is the wonderful humor of the duffel puds, who in this drawing are, are taking a nap, sheltered from rain and sun by their single, uh, single leg and foot. The duffel buds always agree about everything and show the depth of their wisdom by remarks like, what I always say is, when a chap's hungry, he likes some vittles. <laughs> and getting dark now, always does at night. <laughs> and, ah, oh, you've come over the water. Powerful wet stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Readers laugh at this, and so do the characters. The magician and Lucy laugh till tears run down their cheeks as they watch the duffers hop about, relishing the fast one they think they have pulled on the magician. Visible we are, and what I say is, when chaps are visible, why? They can see one another. <laughs> Humor continues to be an appealing feature in the later chronicles. The next one written, The Horse and His Boy, starts with the amusing reversal of a horse helping a human to escape from slavery and from Kellerman. In this book, too, a character laughs. The boy, Shasta, laughs while watching the horse, Bree, have a refreshing roll in the grass. There's also the ironic humor of the only traffic regula regulation in the city of Tashban that everyone who is less important is, has to get out of the way for anyone who is more important. <laughs> the humorous situations culminate in a scene that young readers love, when da Rabidash's armor gets caught on a hook and Rabidash is left dangling like a piece of, of washing hung up to dry and then turns into a donkey. Verbal wit continues in the silver chair, but there is also humor. Um, there's, but there the, there's also humor aimed mostly at children. Children love it as the as the the hearing impaired Trumpkin garbles what Jill and the Owl are trying to communicate to him. The girls called Jill, said the Owl, as loud as it could. What's oh, that? said the dwarf. The girl's all killed. I don't believe a word of it. What girls? Who killed them? Best of all, there is Puddle Glum the Marsh Wiggle, a brilliant comic cre creation, loved by ch adults and children alike. Both uh, children and adults recognize him as a descendant of Eeyore, Christopher Robin's gloomy donkey friend. And there's, hum there's humor in his appearance with his very long legs and arms and very short body, his greeny gray hair, if it can be called hair, and his long, thin face, and his pointed hat surrounded by an enormous brim. There's also his type, pipe tobacco, so heavy that the smoke drifts downward and along the ground. There's his tipsiness after too many swigs from the porter's large black bottle, and there's his gloomy pessimism. It stands to reason that we're not likely to get very far on a journey to the north, not at this time of the year, with winter coming on soon and all, and an early winter too by the look of things. But you mustn't let that make you dis downhearted. Very likely, what with enemies and mountains and rivers to cross, and losing our way, and next to nothing to eat, and sore feet, we'll hardly notice the weather. <laughs> <laughs>
Like the silver chair, the magician's nephew has lots of humor children, kids can appreciate, especially the depiction of Uncle Andrew, his preening, his attempts to get the beautiful witch Jadis to fall in love with him, his being planted and watered by the, the animals, and as if Lewis wanted to make this new direction in the Chronicles mistakable, he includes in the magician's nephew the origins of humor in Narnia. The jackdaw hopes to be remembered for making the first Narnian joke, but he's disappointed when Aslan's replies, no, little friend, you have not made the first joke. You have only been the first joke. <laughs> A second new direction appears as you read the rest of the Don Treader's opening paragraph. Lewis's humorous description of the Scrub family uses satire to mock their modern ideas about parenting and diet and lifestyle. Eustace didn't call his father and mother father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians, non-smokers, and teetotalers and wore a special kind of underclothes. <laughs> in their house, there was very little furniture and very few clothes on the bed, and the windows were always open. There's no pas passage quite like that in The Lion, the Witch, the Witch in the Wardrobe, or Prince Caspian. No previous example of social satire. The specific target here of, is modernism. Eustace attends a modern, a modern school, one that has no physical punishment and seems to encourage grade grubbing. It has a modern headmistress who treats bullies as interesting psychological cases <laughs> and talks to them for hours. We learn in the silver chair that the school is co-educational and is named Experiment House. Edmund's school in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was bad, but it wasn't modern. The same for the schools at the end of Prince Caspian. Bad, but not modern. Eustace keeps boasting about modern liners and motorboats and airplanes and submarines. He reads modern books. They have a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they are weak on dragons. And that turns out to be, a signi be significant to D Eustace later on. Lewis calls attention to something that was qu quietly in the background of the first two books, the fact that Narnia is a pre-modern pre world. It is medieval with knights and swords and castles and damsels in distress. It is a pastoral paradise, unspoiled by the side effects of urbanization and industrialization. It has no cities, no factories, no pollution, and no poverty, though it takes for granted many familiar useful things which require labor, manufacture, and trade, such as Mrs. Beaver's sewing machine. Where, where was it made? Where did she buy it? In The Voyage to Don Treader and later books, Narnia becomes not just pre-modern, but anti-modern. Lewis took pride in his anti-modernism. In 1944, he received a letter from Walnut Creek, California offering him membership in the Society for the Prevention of Progress. <laughs> to which he replied, while feeling that I was born a member of your society, I am nevertheless honored to receive the outward seal of membership. I shall hope by continued orthodoxy and the unremitting practice of reaction, obstruction, and stagnation to give you no reason for repenting your favor. <laughs> One of the reasons Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien bonded so closely is that they shared a dislike of modernity as well as a gift for humor. 
Tolkien and Lewis had a deep affinity for early languages and cultures. The Middle, the Middle Earth that Tolkien creates in The Lord of the Rings is pre-modern. Travel is by horse, foot, or boat. Lighting is by candles and torches. Battles are fought with swords, spears, arrows, and catapults. In a letter Tolkien says of Middle Earth, imaginatively, Middle Earth is supposed to take place in a period of the actual Old West of this planet. In creating Eustace, Lewis brings in satire to comment on modern social issues that Lewis was concerned about in the 1950s. This is different from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and Prince Caspian. The closest to contemporary social issues that either of the first two books gets is the reference to taxes in Prince Caspian. It says, Caspian began to see that Narnia was an unhappy country, that taxes were high, and the laws were stern. Neither the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, nor Prince Caspian has a sentence like Eustace's reply when Edmund and Lucy address Caspian as king. In his diary, Eustace wrote, I said I was a Republican, not a monarchist. But Caspian had to ask me what that meant. He doesn't seem to know anything at all. The, this attention to political and, so, uh, political and economic issues um, leads to the fourth chapter of the, of the Voyage of the Dom Treader, where the citizens and school children of Narrow Haven march to the castle, and in a delightfully humorous and satiric scene, Caspian and Lord Byrne depose Governor Gumpus. Wonderful name, Governor Gumpus. Lewis is clearly satirizing modern bureaucrats with their desks full of letters, dossiers, ink pots, pens, sealing wax and docu documents, and their inaccessibility. No interviews except between 9 and 10 p.m. on second Saturdays. When Caspian points out that slavery is contrary to the ancient custom and usage of Narnia, Gumpus replies, necessary, unavoidable, an essential part of the economic development of the islands. But slave trade is not sound economic development. There is no production of goods that enhance the quality of personal or communi community life. Slave trade involves only paper profits resulting from the dehumanization of other individuals. Thus, Caspian replies with a sentence exposing the practice for what it is. I do, I do not see that the slave trade brings into the islands meat or bread or beer or wine or timber or cabbages or books or instruments of music or horses or armor or anything else worth having. Caspian continues, whether it does or not, it must be stopped. And Gumpus replies with the richly modernist lines, but that would be putting the clock back. Have you no idea of progress, of development? In the word progress here, of course, is loaded with irony. In Mere Christianity, Lewis wrote, you can put a clock back. We all want progress, but progress means getting nearer to the place you want to be. And if you have taken a wrong turning, as Gumpus obviously has, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. In his essay, Is Progress Possible? Lewis wrote, progress for me means increasing goodness and happiness of individual lives. And Lewis did not see goodness and happiness increasing in the modern world. He sums up the theme through a contrast between Lord Burns' estates on the one hand, which he describes as a happy and prosperous fief, and on the other hand, Governor Gumpus's pre preoccupation with accounts and forms and rules and regulations. Such allusions to contemporary social issues appear in each of the later books. In The Horse and His Boy, there is the unappealing description 
of the large modern, modern Kellerman city Tashba. What you would chiefly notice if you had been there was the smells which came from unwashed dogs, scent, garlic, onions, and the piles of refuge which lay everywhere. Lewis was not fond of London, and it's notable that there, were no, there are no cities in Narnia. In the silver chair, in addition to the satire on modern education, there's the delightful satire on modern bureaucrats generally. After the inquiry into Experiment House, friends of the modern headmistress saw that she was no use as a head. So they made her an inspector to interfere with other heads. And when they found out she wasn't much good even at that, they got her into Parliament, where she lived happily ever after. <laughs> and in The Magician's Nephew, there is the moving passage about modern warfare and nuclear weapons. We're not as bad as Charn was, are we? Polly asks, and Aslan replies, not yet, daughter of Eve, not yet. But you are growing more like it. It is not certain that some wicked one of your race will not find out a secret as evil as the deplorable word and use it to destroy all living things. Let your world beware. That is the warning. The most trenchant example of satire on contemporary issues comes through Shift, the ape in the last battle. Many critics view the ape as part of a religious allegory on the end times with, po with possible allusions to antichrists and Armageddon. But a good case can be made for noticing similarities between Shift and Napoleon, the pig in, in George Orwell's Animal Farm, a work that Lewis admired greatly. In Shift's Narnia, as on Animal Farm, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. The policies of the new regime in Narnia resemble those on Animal Farm. Everyone who can work is forced to work, pulling, carrying, digging, the way animals do in other countries. Swift assures the other, other animals that this is not slavery. They will be paid, that is, their wages will go into Aslan's treasury, and Aslan will use them for the good of the whole, which means especially an ample supply of, of Schiff's favorite, of favorite good things, oranges, bananas, and nuts. This line reflects Lewis's concern over the increasing tendency in his day toward collectivism and oligarchy. He disagreed with the policies of the labor government that was voted into office in Britain after World War II, and he pointed out in 1958 that government is no longer looked upon as existing to protect our rights. Modern governments aim to do us good or make us good, any way to do something to us or make, some, make us something. Hence the new name leaders who, uh, for those who once were rulers. We are less their subjects than their wards, pupils, or domestic animals. There is nothing left of which we can say to them, mind your own business. Our whole lives are their business. There is one more new direction I, that I want to that I want to discuss, Lewis's handling of myth. This one is different from the first three in that it is not the addition of something that wasn't there before. Rather, this one involves improvement in what Lewis wanted all along. He wanted to write fairy stories that rise to the level of being myth. Tolkien and Lewis classified The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and the Chronicles of Narnia as fairy stories. Nowadays, publishers and bookstores classify them as fantasy. A fantasy in literary terms is 
a work which takes place in a world which exists only in the imagination of its creator and its readers. A fairy story is a fantasy that takes place in fairyland, the, the realm in which fairies live. Um, a realm that also includes such, animal, uh, such creatures as dwarves, trolls, giants, witches, dragons, and elves. A good fantasy world is independent of our world and self-sufficient. All the information needed to understand actions and meanings must be available within that world. As an imaginary world, it may have natural laws different from those of our world. But once those laws are established, they must be adhere adhered to. If they are ignored or violated, the magic spell of the story will be broken. When fairy stories and or fantasies are especially artistic, beautiful, and moving, when they are perfect in self-contained significance, Lewis and Tolkien believe they can rise to the level of myth. Lewis and Tolkien do not mean myth in its common everyday use, a widely held but false belief. In literary studies, myth refers to stories that deal with matters beyond and above everyday life, things too large or deep or mysterious or incomprehensible for the human intellect to grasp, things whose significance can only be dealt with through imaginative stories. Lewis says that myths touch us deeply in our hearts and souls, and they shock us more fully awake than we are for most of our lives. That was the kind of story Lewis wanted to write in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, he, and that he thought he had written in, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But from the first, there has been confusion or disagreement about the form of the Chronicles of Narnia. Many readers and critics have read the books as allegories, works whose events and characters stand for or point to things outside their fantasy world. An early reviewer, Charles Brady, wrote, allegory is strong in Narnia. And John W. Montgomery held that the Narnian chronicles contained powerful and deep Christian allegory woven into their very fiber. These critics, and many others like them, praised Lewis, ironically, for succeeding in what he was not intending or trying to do. Lewis and Tolkien insist that their works were not allegories. Tolkien wrote in the for foreword to the Lord of the Rings, I cordially dislike allegory in all of its manifestations. Disliked it because he did not intend or want objects, char characters, and actions to have one-on-one -on -one connections with things and meanings outside the story. Lewis tried to set matters straight in, his, in an essay entitled, Sometimes Fairy Stories Say Best What's to Be Said. He wrote, some people seem to think that I began by asking myself how I, should, how I could say something about Christianity to children, then fixed on the fairy tale as an instrument, then drew up a list of basic Christian truths and hammered out allegories to embody them. This is pure moonshine. I couldn't write in that way at all. A good myth, Lewis wrote, is a story out of which ever varying meanings will grow for different readers and different ages. Such, a, such myth is, high, is a higher thing than allegory into which one meaning has been put. Into allegory, authors can put only what they already know. In a myth, they put what they do not yet know and could not come to know in any other way than writing myth. To Lewis and Tolkien, myth transcends allegory because the greater imaginativeness of myth can enable an author to achieve more and better results than he or she could have planned or intended. As Lewis worked on The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, his aim was to create myth. 
And the climax of the story involves one of the great universal myths, the archetypal nature myth of the dying and reviving God, which in its pagan form, Lewis said, he responded to the way one should respond to myth. In a letter to his friend Arthur Greaves, Lewis wrote, I was prepared to feel the myth as profound and suggestive of meanings beyond my grasp, even though I could not say in cold prose what it meant. This myth had been instrumental in Lewis's conversion to Christianity. In a conversation he had had with Tolkien and Hugo Dyson, they convinced him that the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us the same way as the, as the others, as the pagan myths, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. It is God's myth, whereas the others are men's myths. With this great myth at its center, why did readers and critics, including Tolkien, respond to the book as allegory? instead of recognizing it as myth? The answer, I think, is that Lewis unintentionally invites us to read it allegorically by making the context of Aslan's death and resurrection totally biblical and Christian. Lewis didn't show the universality of the nature myth by including allusions to or details from the ancient Greek myths or the Germanic myths that he loved. All of the details allude to the Bible, which makes it seem like Lewis wants readers to look for allegorical type parallels between Aslan and Jesus. If you've read the book, you've prob you're probably familiar with examples. As Aslan is being mocked, tortured, and killed on the stone table, the story describes a crowd of creatures kicking him, hitting him, spitting on him, jeering at him. The similarity to Mark 14 is, seems unmistakable. Some began to spit on Jesus and to strike him. Likewise, when Aslan made no resistance at all to the way they were treating him, it sounds very much like Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Even the stone table itself, with the moral law engraved on it, resembles the tablets of stone that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments written on them by the Lord. Beyond such elusive details, Lewis builds into the lion the witch in the wardrobe the same structure that he used in books two and in books one and two of mere Christianity. Lewis repeatedly pointed out a, a problem that evangelists face in modern times. A, because a sense of sin is almost totally lacking in the modern world. People do not recognize their need for forgiveness until they learn about the law and acknowledge their failure to obey the law. That describes Edmund's situation very well. Lewis sums it up this way in Mere Christianity. It is after you have realized that there is a real moral law and a power behind the law and that you have broken that law and put yourself wrong with that power. It is after all this and not a moment sooner that Christianity begins to talk. Although the form and content of the account of Aslan's death and resurrection and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe are mythical. Lewis's approach as he tells the story seems, seems allegorical. The death of Aslan and his resurrection is a powerful scene, which has a deeply emotional effect and imaginative appeal. In one sense, whether it is allegory or myth doesn't really matter. What matters is that it works. No one would wish to have it, no one would wish to, uh, uh, to have been, that it would have been handled differently than it was. So, allegory or myth, does it matter? 
Well, I think it mattered to Lewis because if it's allegory, to him it is a lesser achievement than if it's myth. Tolkien in On Fairy Stories argues that fantasy is more difficult to write than realistic fiction because the fantasy writer has to create a world, not just copy a world, the world that we live in. Thus, fantasy to, to Tolkien is a higher form of art, capital A. Indeed, the most nearly pure form, and when achieved, the most potent or powerful. Few attempt such difficult tasks, but when they are attempted and in any degree accomplished, then we have a rare achievement of art. Story making in its primary and most potent mode. Lewis knew, Lewis knew Tolkien's essay well. He edited it for the, for the book in which it was published in 1947. It seems possible that one effect of editing the essay was to whet his appetite for attempting again that difficult task, that most purely, nearly pure form of art. And Lewis would have been aware that since many readers and critics took, took it as allegory, not myth, he had not accomplished that rare achievement in the first two books. Perhaps that prodded him to try one more time, to try a different approach, and try to succeed in making his third book less allegorical and more mythical. Mythical characteristics are more readily apparent in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, both in the book as a whole and in key episodes in the book. Lewis draws on a range of myth lore and folklore, Christian and non-Christian. The story as a whole is a series of literal and figurative adventures which explore simultaneously the unknown eastern seas and a range of social, moral, and religious concerns. Running through the episodic adventures, unifying them, and creating a numinous aura is the theme of voyaging. The voyage imagery gives the story the literal flavor of the sea. They tasted the salt on their lips and the figurative flavor of mystery and excitement that large bodies of water always engender. The nature of the story, the quality of the reader's response to it would be very different if it were a journey by land or only a figurative journey. Through form, plot, setting, images, and symbols, Lewis enables readers to engage imaginatively, not seek intellectual meaning. The story of Eustace is a reworking of the story of Edmund. Both boys need to receive and accept a new kind of life. But Eustace's story uses the language and techniques of imagination and myth instead of the language of allegory with its need for interpretation. From the first, Eustace is disagreeable. Down deep inside, he liked bossing and bullying and self-centered. Lucy gives me a little of her water ration. She says girls don't get as thirsty as boys. I had often thought this, but it, ought to be, but it ought to be more generally known at sea. Through his selfishness, laziness, and greed, Eustace, in a wonderfully detailed and realistic scene, discovered, discovers he has turned into a dragon. He spends several days in that state and begins to realize that all along he has been pretty beastly and has behaved like a monster. Eustace, like Edmund, needs to go back and start over. Eustace began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he, thought, as he had always supposed. When he thought of this, the poor dragon that had been Eustace lifted up his voice and wept. A powerful dragon crying its eyes out under the moon in a deserted valley is a sight and a sound hardly to be imagined. 
Lewis doesn't use the word repentance, but he doesn't need to. The scene and the images he creates convey the meaning clearly. No interpretation is needed. Aslan appears, but it is mysteriously. Eustace doesn't know if the lion is real or a dream and doesn't know if the lion actually speaks to him, though he is certain that the lion somehow tells him to follow, and he knows that he is full of fear and full of awe. The lion leads him to a pool in a garden on a mountain. The water in the pool, Eustace later tells Edmund, was as clear as anything, and I thought if I could get in there and bathe, it would ease the pain in my leg. But the lion told me I must undress first. Three times Eustace peels off his dragon skin, and three times it grows right back. Then the lion said, but I don't know if it spoke. You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty near desperate now. So I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. Well, he pulled the beastly stuff right off. Just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. Then he caught hold of me and threw me into the water. It smarted like anything but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm. And then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. After a bit, the lion took me out and dressed me. Dressed you with his paws? Well, I don't exactly remember that bit, but he did somehow or other in new clothes, the same I've got on now, as a matter of fact. And then suddenly I was back here. Like the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, this episode has Christian imagery, such as the use of the number three, the inability of Eustace to change himself, and the new clothes. But in this book, Lewis does not try to explain the imagery. Lewis has, just has Eustace tell his story, and he lets the story speak for itself, especially through water as a Christian and universal symbol. The use of water is effective because of the inherent virtues of water as a cleansing agent, and the use of water, especially emerge, immer, immersion into and rising out of water, is effective in symbolizing rebirth because of the archetypal associations of water with death and life. This stage of Eustace's spiritual journey then, which began as he fell into the briny waters of a picture at home, culminates in the well of life on a mountain in Narnia. In the words of the story, after his experience on Dragon Island, Eustace began to be a different boy. He had been on the wrong road. He did an about turn and returned to the right road. And now he is ready to move on. A similar use of story, symbol, and metaphors and myth occurs as Lucy looks into the magician's book in the magician's house. It's a mysterious book. There was, for example, no title page or title. The spells began straight away. Also, you couldn't turn back. The right-hand pages, the ones ahead, could be turned. The left-hand pages could not. As Lucy gazes at a page, she sees a picture of a girl standing at a reading desk, reading in a huge book. And the girl was dressed exactly like Lucy. It's clear, even without interpretation, that the book is a metaphor for Lucy's life. Within that book of life are a variety of opportunities to do good or evil, 
and a variety of temptations, some of which hold little or no appeal for Lucy, others which attract her and could well catch her in their spell. It is the latter that de develop her character the most. The temptations of pride and curiosity try her greatly, and she even gives in to curiosity, to her sorrow and loss. But the magician's book is not only a book of life, of experience and temptation. It is also a book of life, with book and life capitalized. Lucy encounters a series of pages which are more like a story than a spell. In them, she reads the loveliest story she ever read or ever shall read in her whole life. She mysteriously does not remember the story after she finishes, but she can recall a few of the images in it. It was about a cup and a sword and a tree and a green hill. These images can be taken as Christian. The, the cup, a cup as the chalice, a sword as the spear that pierced Christ's side, a tree as the cross, and the green hill as Calvary. But they don't have to be taken as Christian. Images suggest, they don't insist. These images could be suggesting that any lovely story can remind us of the loveliness and the lovingness of Christ. Exp explanations and interpretations are not needed. Experiencing the myth is what we're invited to do. And Lewis does a lovely thing here with myths. Just as myths in our world can be realities in Narnia, such as Father Christmas or Bacchus, so what is reality in our world can become myth in Narnia. If Lucy were a Narnian, reading the lovely story in the magician's book would not be enough. She would need to grow closer to God in his Narnian incarnation as Aslan. But Lucy isn't a Narnian. For her, knowing Aslan is not enough. Lucy needs to grow closer to God in his in earthly incarnation as Jesus the Christ. Thus, Lucy asks Aslan, Shall I ever be able to read that story again, the one I couldn't remember? Will you tell it to me, Aslan? Oh, do, do, do. And Aslan replies, indeed, yes. I will tell it to you for years and years. For us, as persons living in our world and reading the Narnian myths during Lent, for a lecture series at the McGrath Institute for Church Life, the situation is reversed. The Narnian myth about Aslan's love and sacrifice can be a means of drawing us nearer to the divine realities in our world. But that would not be enough by itself. That is made clear by a wonderful mythic passage at the end of the voyage, when Edmund, Lucy, and Eustace arrive at the end of the world and wade to the shore. In a scene which rises to the level of high myth, the children see a lamb cooking fish on the seashore. Please, lamb, said Lucy, is this the way to Aslan's country? Not for you, said the lamb. For you, the door into Aslan's country is from your own world. What, said Edmund? Is there a way into Aslan's country from our world too? There is a way from my, into my country from all the world, said the lamb. But as he spoke, his snowy white flushed into tawny gold, and his size changed, and he was Aslan himself, towering above them and scattering light from his mane. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, will you tell us how to get into your country from our world? I shall be telling you all the time, said Aslan, but I will not tell you how long or short the way will be, only that it lies across a river. But do not fear that, for I am the great bridge builder. 
And now come, I will open the door in the sky and send you to your own land. It is a powerfully evocative passage, making marvelous use of images and symbols which can be Christian but don't need to be. Light, lamb, lion, river, bridge, door. Even the biblical allusion to John 21, which underlies the whole scene, is not presented as applying only to Christianity. It is myth, not allegory. Readers are not asked to impose one-on-one -on -one intellectual applications of details in the passage. All its components unite to let the passage appeal directly to the emotions and the imagination. As Lewis says, great myth always does. For children and adults reading the Narnian stories in our world, this episode and the other Narnian myths can be a useful part of their life journey. But progress toward spiritual maturity requires more, as Aslan explains to Lucy and to Edmund. Lucy asks, before we go, will you tell us when we can come back to Narnia again, please? And oh, do, do, do make it soon. Dearest, said Aslan very gently, you and your brother will never come back to Narnia. Oh, Aslan, said Edmund and Lucy both together in despairing voices. You are too old, children, said Aslan, and you must come close to your own world now. It isn't Narnia, you know, sobbed Lucy. It's you. We shan't meet you there. And how can we live never meeting you? But you shall meet me, dear one, said Aslan. Are, are you there too, sir, said Edmund. I am, said Aslan. But there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. This was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. That last sentence explains Lewis's hopes and intentions for the whole series. By getting to know Aslan through reading myths about him in the Chronicles of Narnia, the book's readers learn to know Christ better as a reality in our world. Perhaps Lewis knew from the start how he wanted its Chronicles to work, but some evidence suggests that it came to him later. He wrote in a 1956 essay that when he started the series, he did not set out to write Christian books. Everything began with images, a fawn carrying an umbrella, a queen on a sledge, a magnificent lion. At first, there wasn't any, even anything Christian about them. As he worked with the images, the qualities inherent in the images asserted themselves. The Christian element, he says, pushed itself in of its own accord. This was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. I believe this expresses a realization Lewis arrived at as he explored new directions in this third book, a realization that enabled him to write four more books, each containing at least one powerfully mythic episode or passage. In the silver chair, there's the resurrection scene after Aslan, Jill, and Eustace come upon Caspian lying dead in a stream of water, and, and a drop of Aslan's blood awakens Caspian to new life in Aslan's country. In The Horse and His Boy, there is the most numinous scene in the Chronicles in which a large, unseen creature walks through the night alongside, Sha alongside Shasta, the boy, and answers Shastine, Shasta's question, Who are you? Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, so that the earth shook. And again, myself loud and clear and gay. 
And then the third time, myself whispered so softly you could hardly hear it. And yet it seemed to come from all around you as the, if the leaves rustled with it. In The Magician's Nephew, there's the wonderful creation scene or creation myth. And in The Last Battle, the equally wonderful end of the world myth and world beyond the end of the world myth of Aslan's country of heaven. The Voyage of the Dawn Trader is a good book for Lent. Running through it is a theme of penitence and spiritual growth for Caspian, Lucy, and Eustace. But especially for the, if, but, but especially, um, sorry. Uh, but especially for Reba Cheap the Mouse with his giant-sized longing to be with Aslan forever. The beautiful paragraph, with the beautiful paragraph describing his myth, I will close. As the dawn treader nears Reepicheep's goal, the images of sea and ship return. The sea is the silver sea, a body of sweet water covered with lilies, a traditional symbol of life. The ship is a coracle, a tiny boat, barely four feet long, with room only for Reepicheep. In this final stage of his journey toward spiritual fulfillment, toward union with Aslan, he must go on alone. The sense of voyaging with its peculiar overtones of romance and nostalgia is powerful at the end of the voyage, created especially by two images, mountains and music, which Lewis always associated with longing. As Rebecheep as leaves the children to go on in his coracle and bids them goodbye, he tries to be sad for their sakes, but he quivers with happiness. Then hastily he got into his coracle and took his paddle, and the current caught it, caught it and away he went, very black against the lilies. But no lilies grew on the wave. It was a smooth green slope. The coral went more and the coracle went more and more quickly, and beautifully it rushed up the wave's side. For one split section, for one split second, they saw its shape and Rebecheep shape on the very top. Then it vanished. And since that moment, no one can truly claim to have seen Rebecheep the mouse. But my belief, says the narrator, is that he came safe to Aslan's country and is alive there to this very day. His longing for Aslan's country and for being in Aslan's presence has been perfectly fulfilled. May that be true also for all of us.